them were converted uh, to the prophet's message, not necessarily because of its content, but because of its beauty. That revelation was presented in a society where there were people who were professional memorizers. They could hear something recited once and they could repeat it. The recitation then by Muhammad was carefully preserved immediately in the minds of memorizers and in the minds of people who were able to write down notes what we now call the Qur'an represented the complete collection of those words that Muhammad recited when he said, this is the revelation of God. All we have of, of the Prophet and all we have of the Word of God is actually words. We don't have any pictures. We don't have any statues. All we have left is words. We can take those words and through the art of calligraphy, we can make them more vivid, more accessible. For Muhammad Zakaria, words are the basis of an art form. To prevent idolatry, Muhammad discouraged the creation of any images of himself or other prophets. Calligraphy eventually became Islam's highest art form. Among the sacred texts that Zachariah writes is the Hilya, a portrait of the Prophet in words. Transmitted from Ali, who, when asked to describe the Prophet, would say, His face was not narrow, nor was it fully round, but there was a little bit of roundness to it. When he looked at someone, he looked at them with his face turned perfectly towards them. Whoever saw him unexpectedly was in awe of him, and whoever associated with him familiarly loved him. Anyone who would describe him would say, I never saw before him or after him the like of him. Peace be upon him. That's the most famous of the Hidiyas. It gives you a description of the qualities of a person so that you can almost see them in your uh, eyes, in your mind's eye. I like to think it's like having a little memento of the prophet near you so that you can look at it and think of it now and then and of course he's not with us but the hidya brings him uh, his presence a little closer muhammad was always very insistent that he was not a divine figure and he always warned his followers not to do with him what the Christians had done to Jesus and put him on a pedestal and say that he was God or, or divine. He was, he was not. He was an ordinary human being. And the Muslims have taken that seriously. But what they do say is that Muhammad is the perfect man. That if you look at Muhammad, you can see how a perfect act of surrender to the divine can be made. Allahu Akbar. Muhammad's message slowly began to attract followers, especially among the downtrodden and the oppressed within Meccan society. It's really the people that don't have anything uh, to lose and everything to gain. They're the ones that are responding to this message. Many of the followers are poor people, slaves, women that don't have protectors. It's spreading amongst the disenfranchised of Mecca. Prophet Muhammad noticed that he lives in a society that downgrades women. They were viewed as a second-hand citizen, an object of personal belongings that belong to the man. And that disturbed the, the Prophet. Early in his prophetic career, Muhammad condemned female infanticide. Later revelations would give women legal rights in marriage, allow them to divorce, and protect their inheritance rights. Of course, it's absurd and anachronistic to be, expect Muhammad to be a, a, a feminist in the 21st century sense. Uh, but nevertheless, what he did for women in the context of his time was amazing. Although most women were second-class citizens in pre-Islamic Arabia, Muhammad's own wife, Khadija, was wealthy and powerful. 
There's been this idea that women prior to Islam were chattel, that they had no rights. And I think that for many, many levels of the women, that is true. But for a certain level of woman, which Khadija would have been amongst, that is not true. Khadija is, is an inspiration because in spite of the male-dominated society that she lived in, she was a working woman. And so there are some parallels for modern women to, to learn from her example. I grew up in Kashmir, which is in the foothills of the Himalayas in northern India. And um, I came to America when I was 15 years old. As I started becoming part and parcel of this culture and society, I gravitated towards just wanting to be like everybody else and tended to stray away from my own faith. And for a while there, I went through some very, very dark stages in my life where I wanted nothing to do with my faith. And I almost just walked away from my faith. And as I got older, I recognized that there was this very empty hole inside of me. So I started searching for God in all kinds of places. You know, Rumi has this beautiful story where he says, I looked for God, I went to a temple and I didn't find him there. Then I went to a church and I didn't find him there. And then I went to a mosque and I didn't find him there. And then finally I looked in my heart and there he was. The challenges that I faced in my life are the very same challenges that a lot of young girls are facing. And when they come to me with their questions, I feel like a person who has already traveled the road. I dispense advice to them from real experience as to how I would have dealt with something. I've noticed how when it comes to women, we are only supposed to marry Muslim men. Why is that now, especially um, because the Quran says that believing men and women should marry believing men and women. It doesn't point out that men can marry such and women can't. I've heard plenty of people say that. In fact, that's interpretation. To, to Some Muslim. of the issues so are deeply personal. Uh, issues with gender relations like dating and uh, marriage. And other issues have to do with certain Islamic law and how to reconcile with some of those things. <laughs> I want to change with her. See, okay. hers is prettier. <laughs> and these are all sticky wickets, as we say. The fact that I've walked the walk helps a little okay. bit for me to dispense advice to these people. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha In Mecca, opposition to Muhammad was growing. His message of monotheism and his campaign against idolatry threatened